Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. The purpose of the Primetime Tuesday night meeting is to talk about the reason to come to Alcoholics Anonymous, to describe the disease of alcoholism, not just as a word, but as a living mind power disease, how the disease appears and functions, so awareness of the disease is there to see and recognize. Alcoholism is called ism because it is alive and functioning and needs to be treated. We discuss here strictly the disease as it functions in each of our own personal lives, the way our behavior is this day, the way we react or look at people, places, and things. We do not talk about drunk lots, yesterday's problems, or blaming other people. We talk only about looking inwardly, describing how self behaves in the day we are in. We do refer to steps, but only in describing the treatment or non-treatment of our disease today. This is not a step study meeting. First, I will talk about the purpose of coming to AA for approximately 25 to 30 minutes. Then we will have sharing or questions and answers. Okay. See, I can't see that. Okay, here we go. I'm Craig. I'm an alcoholic. Armin loves me to say I'm an alcoholic and my problem is Craig. He loves that one. And that's the truth. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm grateful to be here and, uh, you know, um, Thanks, David. And that's the way it is. You know, we have a lineage, and uh, and I'm really grateful uh, that my good friend, you know, I always admired him and the way he acts and conducts himself. And, and when I decided to really get serious about this at eight years sober, uh, I decided to, to take the steps precisely out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous to have that experience. Um, this is a meeting of prime time, and uh, we, we, we talk about the, we don't talk about drunk logs the first half of step one. We talk more about the second half of step one. A lot of people don't realize there's two parts to step one. The first part being about the drinking. The only time alcohol is mentioned. But the second part is about the unmanageable thought life. Because that dash separates those two statements as well as connects them. And so it's not about a drunk log, it's about a think log. What is my mind doing today? Sober. What is my mind doing right now? And he's saying, you're, you're probably judging me. If you have, if you, and if even if you know me, you're probably judging me. And that's good. And it's probably not a good judgment, uh, because alcoholism, alcoholism is a, is a disease of perception. And it says disease, 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 disease. You know, in the big book, it never called it a disease. It called it an illness. But we like to talk about a guy named Dr. Harry Tebow, who, who tried, he was a psychiatrist, and he couldn't treat alcoholics for not, nothing. No doctors, no psychiatrists to this day can really treat us. They have all the knowledge in the world, but it took him to get a copy of the big book and give it to one of his female clients, Marty Mann, who read it and recovered from reading. Because they didn't have sponsors then. They didn't have meetings where, you know, in a lot of the places they were. The big book was your program of recovery. That's why it's so important. That, that was the first time in man's history that, that this deadly disease called alcoholism, it is, it is in me today at ten and a half years sober. It's in David at nine years sober. It's in all of us today. If it's not treated, it can be really deadly. So the whole idea is arresting that. See, I'm not cured of alcoholism, it says. I have, I, I, what I have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. And, uh, And so it says I have recovered, and I have recovered. I want you to know that this is a program of absolute recovery. But recovery is only in the day I'm in, and I only have recovery if I'm doing recovery. I only get drunk when I'm drinking alcohol. And the application of drinking alcohol is to pick it up and to drink it. I can't get drunk by looking at it. I can't read the label or talk about it. Oh, man, that alcohol, and it does this and it does that. No, the application is to drink it. Same with drugs. You know, I gotta do it. And the application of this is the, is to take the 12 steps in an order form. It's to go to meetings. We got the triangle, you know, and the, the, the foundation of it is the 12 steps of recovery. And cause this is a 12 step program in an order form to produce a character change in me because I bring a character here. 
And, and, and it's not going to change overnight. Just because I'm not drinking, I'm still the same asshole I always was. And it's about me seeing that uh, and willing to do something about it because I can be actually worse sober because I'm not treating my illness. As, as, as H.E. said, you know, like I, I, I needed to drink to get up. I needed to drink, you know, I used to smoke joints to go ride my bike 100 miles and play basketball one-on-one and, you know, climb mountains and, you know, and work in the studio all night, you know, at the, and, and things, you know, people chill out on, not me, you know, I need, I need a, a reward for my efforts and I need to, 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 you know, psych myself up. So, you see, Dr. Silkworth says in the doctor's opinion that, you know, we drink basically because we like the effect produced by alcohol. And that we admit, while we admit it's injurious to us, we cannot differentiate the true from the false. Our alcoholic life seems the only normal one. Because we are restless, irritable, and discontented. That's my alcoholism. I am restless, irritable, and discontented. Unless I can get that sense of ease and comfort that comes at once by taking a few drinks. Ah, there it is. See, that's my treatment. There's two treatments for alcoholism. One is alcohol. It works real fast. It gives me an immediate sense of ease and comfort. But the problem with me, and probably with you too, is that once I drink, the phenomena craving occurs. That's what makes me different. This is the physical allergy. All an allergy means is an adverse reaction to something. I don't have to break out in, in, in you know, maybe you break out in handcuffs or something. But I, I, I didn't have that experience. But I, I, I never liked allergy because I thought I had to break out in welts or something. But allergy means an adverse reaction to something. And when I drink, I can't stop. The phenomenon of craving occurs. I go on a spree, ending remorseful, making firm resolutions to never do this again. And this is repeated over and over and over and over. And unless I can ex- experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope of my recovery. Now, Dr. Silkworth said them amazing words, but he had no clue how to give that entire psychic change. That entire psychic change that David was talking about was through the application of the principles embodied in the 12 steps of recovery in an order form, like a ladder. I want to jump to the top because my, 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 my uh, ego that Dr. Tebow discovered about is very impatient. It's very defiant. It's very grandiose and omnipotent. It tolerates frustration very poorly. I have to see this in myself. These characteristics, these traits, these characteristics that make up the character that I brought here. I built a character over a lot of years. It ain't going to get, you know, it says a body badly burned by alcohol doesn't uh, uh, recover in a twinkling, nor do twisted minds and depression vanish quickly. This is, a, you know, about coming here, and we all are here. Congratulations, everybody. We're all here. We're probably surrendered to the alcohol and the physical part of the illness. The first half of step one, that I am powerless over alcohol or some other mind-altering substance. But that that's the only thing I've done perfectly for ten and a half years. But the, the, the what's really hard to do is to really recognize the unmanageable life. See, I have to be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. And that ain't going to happen until I hit enough of getting to enough pain. If you're feeling any discomfort in your sobriety, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. That's why we have a program of recovery. Because lack of power, that was our dilemma. See, I don't have alcohol to treat my alcoholism anymore. It doesn't work. I get into a lot of, there's a lot of side effects, like prison, like, you know, hospitals, institutions, uh, divorces, uh, lost jobs, you name it. But I thought when I put the plug in the jug, I was going to be okay. And it is a lot better. I love my life today in the physical plane. But, you know, my story is my bottom happened to two years sober. For two years sober, I wanted to put a gun to my head. That's how much pain my mind was telling me. It was so loud. You hear about the committee. Mine was the lynch mob. It had, it was just telling me, and it was worthlessness, and, you know, and what it says in our print, is if temporarily on the depressive side, we are apt to be swamped with guilt and self-loathing. We wallow in a messy bog, often getting a misshapen and painful pleasure out of it. As we morbidly pursue this melancholy activity, we sink to such a point of despair that nothing but oblivion seems like a possible solution. See, here we have lost all perspective. This is not humility. This is pride in reverse. In the, ver- in the old days, the first step, there were six of them. The first one was complete deflation. 
And it's just like the first beatitude, which our literature came from a, a guy named Emmett Fox who wrote a book called Sermon on the Mount based off of those principles, but it was scientific metaphysics, you know, uh, and, and, and it was a different way of looking at, at print. Every, every kind of spiritual book. It's, you can say a prayer, for instance, uh, you know, the Lord's Prayer and look at it in the three dimensional world and it's lead us not into temptation. Okay. Don't let me drink anymore. Don't let me use anymore. Don't let me, you know, eat too much. Don't let me smoke cigarettes. Whatever that temptation might be in the carnal world. But in the spiritual application, and this is a spiritual program of action, because not only am I mentally and physically ill, I am spiritually sick. And when that spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. That's what our book says on 64. And that's why, you know, liquor is but a symptom, and we had to get down to causes and conditions. So, uh, I don't know where I was going. I'm going all over the place. But, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. Because it's all about being in the solution and not going to the problem. The perception that my alcoholism is in all the time when it's untreated, when I'm left to my own devices and the ego is running the show along with alcoholism, I'm not in, in good shape. My perception sucks. You're not doing it right. God's not doing it right. I'm not doing it right. Nothing is right. I'm a victim. I'm not getting mined. You know, my cups are half empty. It's a horrible way to live. And that's how I was living. And it says, Lack of power. That was our dilemma. So we had to find a power by which we could live. And it had to be a power greater than ourselves, obviously. So where and how are we to find us power? Well, that's exactly what the big book was about. Its main object was enable you and I, the sufferer, to find a power greater than ourselves, which would solve our problem. See, alcohol is not my problem. That was my solution. I'm an alcoholic, and my problem is Craig. Plain and simple. Why? Because I'm the only one that can make the choices for myself. And I have a bad picker. Everything is based on the free will that the creator of all things has given me. And I don't know what that creator is. And, and this is a God-inspired program. The word God comes up a lot. But just know that God is personal to you. You don't need to believe. This is what our book says. You don't need to believe in anyone else's conception of God. It's just a word. Deep down inside, every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of this thing called God. And it is only there that he may be found. He, she, it, something, you see. And all I have to do in step two is to believe, do I now believe or am I willing to believe that something greater than me could restore me to sanity? Sanity being soundness of mind. One of the definitions of sobriety is soundness of mind. So what we talk about here in prime time is the emotional sobriety, the next frontier. Because like H.E. was saying, I didn't come here to be miserable. I didn't come here to endure a life uh, uh, uh uh, based on a perception of negativity and fault finding and negative judging, because I'm the best at that. I'm the best at negative judging. This is where I'm playing God. And you know the principle of judge not or you shall be judged. That's what I'm doing. So it's all about a thought life. What is my mind doing right now? What am I, what am I thinking? If, if you're judging me, saying, what the hell is he talking about? I don't like this. You know, whatever. I, I understand because that's what I do. And the first thing I do is I ask this power, this power greater than any human power, this power, that one who is God, may you find him now, right here in this moment. By the way, that's all prime time is. Prime time just means right now is prime time. This moment, the only moment I belong in. Because what I do with my thinking, my free will, is I future surf. I go into the future, and that's where fear is. Fear of losing what I have, not getting what I want, coupled around the instincts of money and security, Sex and reproduction. He did this. She did this. She's going to do that. I better do this. And society. He don't like me. I don't like him. She don't like, you know, all that crap. I need to be someone. Or I go to the past and it's filled with regret, remorse. Why did I do that? Should have done that. Shouldn't have done, you know, and it's, it's a no, you know, alcoholism. When I go to my own mind, it's a no win situation. It doesn't matter if I go left or if I go right. It's always, I should have done that. Why did I do this? I'm never, I can't win. That's why what I've learned here is I ask God to go with me. See, as we look at our 20, uh, ahead, we may face indecision. We may not be able to determine which course to take. Here we ask God for inspiration, intuitive thought or decision. And then we relax, take it easy, and don't struggle. We're often surprised how the right answers come after we have tried this for a while. 
what used to be the hunch or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of mind. They're not just words. That's a truth. A principle is a law. It's a doctrine. It's a truth. One plus one equals two. That's a mathematical principle. A triangle has equal uh, sides. <laughs> 60 de degrees on each side. It can, it's always that. I think that's, you know. Water seeks its own level. Gravity. It always falls on the planet Earth. On the moon, it's a different principle. I go like this, and it goes out forever. But here on planet Earth, water seeks its own level. And so AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in their nature, which, if practiced, key word, practiced as a way of life, can expel that obsession to drink in the first half of step one and that obsession to think the way I do in the second half of step one and enable you and I, the sufferer, to become happily usefully whole. That's what I always wanted because that's why so many of us probably go out. Relapse is not a part of my story yet. And I don't intend it to be. I got this first time and I've watched people die, too many people die from this disease, sober, because this is a deadly, deadly illness. It will take your soul without your consent. And, you know, we can, you know, and it's nothing to be joked at. It's so serious because I'm the one who determines I have it. A doctor can't tell me I have it. He can't x-ray it. He can't do a blood test. The only thing is a desire to stop drinking. And step one says, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. Now, admitting is a principle. It's something done with reluctance. I do it reluctantly. And, you know, I give this example. It's funny. It's very, for those of you that can't picture it, you stole that. No, I didn't. You stole that. No, I didn't. We have you on video stealing that. Okay, I admit it. You see, it's, it, it's a little more, you need these little pictures of it. It's done with reluctance. Yeah, I'm an alcoholic. I don't like it. But you see, that's how I get my foot in the door. There's a form of compliance to that. What I really need to do next is accept my devastating weakness. It says, we know little good can come to any alcoholic who joins AA until he has first accepted his devastating weakness and all its consequences. What is that? Well, the devastating weakness in the first half of step one, obviously, is alcohol. It caused me a lot of trouble. And it's not working for me because of the allergy nature of it. And I, and I cannot resist, resist its demands, you know. Knowing that I have a phenomenon of craving, I lack with sufficient force to remember the pain and suffering of even a week or month ago. I am without defense against the first drink. I can't not even take that first drink. That's, you know, so I'm, I have a bad chooser. So, uh, until I accept the devastating weakness in the second hand, uh, second half of step one, that it's my mind and the way I think, my sobriety will be, be precarious, it says. See, until I so humble myself to the fact and accept this, that I have it, and I'm, i got to do something about it. And of real happiness, I'll know none at all. Like I said, I didn't come here to be miserable. I found real happiness today. I found a way to live that's beyond anything I could have ever dreamed, but it took absolute surrender for me. And it's all through the pain. See, pain is the touchstone to all spiritual progress. Because without pain... I won't do this thing. Why all the insistence that every AA must hit bottom first? Because who wishes to be rigorously honest? Who wishes to make amends and restitution for harm done? Who wishes to pray and meditate? Not me. Who wishes to help a, another alcoholic? Forget it. Not unless I have to do these things in order to stay alive myself. See? That's how selfish I am. I will become unselfish. See, that's the conundrum of this program. I can't keep it unless I give it away. I can't win unless I surrender. And, you know, I am that selfish. I don't want to die. I don't want to, you know, I, my head told me I wanted to die, but that's just because I was in so much pain and I was so lost. My powerlessness finally turned out to be the firm bedrock upon which happy and purposeful lives may be built. See, only through utter defeat am I able to take my first steps. Because unless I'm feeling some pain, I'm not going to do this. See, under the lash of alcoholism, I am driven to AA. And there I discover the fatal nature of my situation. Sober, it's talking about in the 12 and 12. The fatal nat nat uh, nature of my situation. And then, and only then, do I become as open-minded to conviction Am I open-minded to conviction and willing to listen as the dying can be? I stand ready to do anything that will lift this merciless obsession. Anything. So I've accepted, and what I have to do in step one is surrender. 
I got this thing. I know it. I can't live this any more way anymore. Please tell me what do I do? This is what rockets me into step two, where I come to believe that a power greater than me could restore me to soundness of mind. And no one can say that, you know, to sanity it says. What I was doing out there, you know, you know, I, I wound up in a tent in my living room catching on fire. And, you know, some of you know my story. We don't talk about drunk logs, but there's a couple seconds just to know that, uh, you know, uh, a choir boy, Mr. PTA guy, uh, father of two, faithful husband of 30 years, could fall into that same trap. It's a non-discriminatory illness. It will take anybody. And uh, unfortunately, it's so deadly. I'm grateful to be on this side of it. And I'm grateful to be able to try to carry this message to others especially alcoholics. That's how it was originally written, you know. What I'm up against, though, is the defiant nature of my ego. Dr. Tebow has one paragraph in the back of the big book, because, and he has books, and he's in, uh, in uh, AA Comes of Age, and there's papers. You can look him up. Primetime has him on their website, primetimeisnow.com. But his one paragraph basically says that his function as a psychiatrist, the only thing he can do is try to break down our inner resistance, the patient's inner resistance. So that which is inside him will, will flower as under the activity of the AA program. See, what's here works, but it's me saying it won't. The principle for everlasting ignorance is contempt prior to investigation. I'm the best at that. That means I say it won't work, and I've never even tried it. Don't try to figure this out if you're new. You can't, and I can't take these steps. I, I need honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. And I ask God for the willingness. I don't even have willingness. God, whatever you are, could you give me the willingness to be willing? Because I don't have it. I don't see it. I can't figure it out. It don't make sense to me. And I'm dying here. But, you know, and this is what I'm up against. It says this on 44 of the big book. To be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis are not always easy alternatives to face. Why do I even have to consider that? It's almost humorous, but it's tragic. To be doomed to an alcoholic death, and that don't mean I'm drinking. We've, we've known a lot of people in this program with multiple, multiple years. And one of the messages of prime time, which David alluded to, is time is, an, time is wonderful. I'm proud of it. Some of us have a lot of time in this room. And I would never, I'm so proud. The only thing I have time for is my physical abstinence from all mind-altering substances. But my actual emotional sobriety. See, I didn't even feel worthy of a cake in my first two years. I don't deserve it. And my sponsor said, you deserve it more than anybody because I would have had money on you that you were going to drink. You were suffering so much. If anybody deserved a drink, it was you. And, you know, the thing here that we talk about, it's in the day we're in. We're all tied for today, see? And, and it's so important to take these steps in an order form to produce a change, a shift in my consciousness, a shift in my perception, the way I look at things. And today, not only are my cups half full, my cups runneth over, you know. So it's because my perception, it's the more the ego gets out of the way. And, and this ego is not my amigo. I mean, we all hear that, those sayings. It is not. It is my biggest enemy, and I have one of the biggest ones. It's been really tough, you know. I... You know, I was in the music business. I was a recording artist. I thought I could do it. You know, I was the, you know, God's gift to the earth, all this stuff, the head shakes. See, that's the ego. Oh, you know. And it's like, and you know what? I'm sick of it. I don't need to prove nothing to anybody anymore. I got tired of being tired. I don't need to be right anymore. See, it's all about humility. And step one, the humility is to see the absolute humiliation, the pummeling that alcohol did to me, beat me into a state of reasonableness. But then, the second half of step one, that my mind is warped and I can't go to it anymore, that I don't have the power to stop, not only stop drinking, but to stop thinking, and that only an act of providence could remove it from me, that's, that's humbling. So I humble myself even more and I, I start to consider step two. Step two is a beautiful step because it's for us alcoholics especially because we either had God and lost it or never had it to begin with. For the agnostic, the atheist, or, or, or the believer. And for me, we try to hold on to our old ideas, but the result is nil. Do we let go? Absolutely. I have old ideas about everything, including God. I had a punishing God. And AA gave me permission to put down that and start exploring. This is about experimenting. Search and research again and again. 
always with the open mind. That's what a scientist does to get scientific progress. You can substitute spiritual progress for scientific. And if I search and research again and again, always with a truly open mind, I will get some experience. I start to, something starts to happen. This is experientialized. I can't intellectualize it. I must experience this because that's the only thing. This is a God of my experience. And uh, I don't know how much time, how much time. So, you know, in step one and then step two, I humble myself and I start to consider this. Do I now believe or am I even willing to believe? As soon as a man can say that he's willing to believe, we assure him he's on his way. That's the cornerstone. And now what I got to do is make a decision to turn my will, which is what I want, what I do with what I want, and my life, which is me, who I am, my soul, the very core of my being. My living is what I think my life is, the girl, the job, the car, the money, the stuff, the house. But that's my living. That's a part of my life. And that will never be enough. That will never fill the spiritual hole that's inside me. See, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What that means is meekness is a form of humility where nothing of this earth has me anymore. So I am the king of my kingdom. But when anything has more power than my thoughts, then I'm in trouble. If the girl or the guy is, 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 is on my mind all the time, that's a power greater than me. See, whatever's on my mind is a power greater than me. Money, I need more money. It's not enough. My, see, there's nothing wrong with alcohol. There's just never enough of it. I have a disease of excess. And, it, you know, and it's the obsession of every abnormal drinker that he might someday drink like a normal person. It's the obsession of every abnormal thinker that he may someday think like a normal person. But you see, our steps have promises in them. So when, when I wake up, I got to do this first thing. You know, I've taken the first nine steps. I've cleaned the, the wreckage of my past. In prime time, we talk about one, two, and three. But I also need to clean house in four, five. And in six and seven, I expose my defects and ask God to remove them. And in eight and nine, I clean up and make right the wrongs of my past. And I walk a free man. In ten, I have to continue to take personal inventory. When I'm wrong, promptly admit it. And that's to continue to watch for resentment, selfishness, dishonesty, and fear. And when they crop up, not if, when. I, I go to God at once. I ask God at once to remove them. I share them with someone else. And then I call someone and see how they're doing. I turn my thoughts to someone else. I call up a newcomer uh, or a sponsor. How are you doing today? Because I need a distraction. The laws of substitution. The mental equivalent to substitute a good thought for a bad thought. Because otherwise the merciless obsession goes on the resentment or on the fear or on the problem over and over. That's what my alcoholism is. And then in the 11th step, it's not just prayer and meditation. It's very specific in the big book. There's a set of suggestions, which are what the steps are called. There's actually a set of steps. When I retire at night, I do a written inventory. My sponsor taught me, and I'm teaching my sponsors how. And, and it's amazing. I sit for one or two minutes every night. Was I, was I resentful, selfish, dishonesty? It reminds me of my 10th step. Do I owe an apology? Is there something I should have shared at once? Was I kind and loving to all? What could I have done better? You know, uh, uh, what did I do for others today? And what did I pack into the stream of life? I used 10 things. And then I asked God, forgive me for where I have fallen short and direct me to any corrective measures which need to be taken. Now I go to sleep. A six and seven are kind of coming alive again because I've given it to God and I've seen my faults of the day. I've seen my goods in the day. And they build and something happens. And then when I wake up, you hear me share a lot. I wake up in alcoholism every morning. It says on awakening, we look at the 24 hours ahead. Oh, my God, here we go again. It's Groundhog Day. I got you, babe. You know, we consider our plans for the day. Oh, my God, how am I going to do this? I got to do that. I got to pay that bill. Oh, I don't have the money. Oh, my God, she's I hate that person, this and that. No, before we begin, it says, before we begin, we ask God. Oh, I turn it. I turn it into a prayer. God, I'm asking you to direct my thinking especially asking that it be divorced from self-pity, my favorite thing, self-pity, dishonest and self-seeking motives. That covers a lot, self-seeking. Even my prayers have helped me feel better, help me not have alcoholism. That's a self-seeking motive. You know, now, under those conditions, it says, I can employ my mental faculties with assurance, for after all, God gave me brains to use. I don't doubt that. It says that. I believe that. That is a promise. I claim it because I did the things that it asked me to do. See, my thought life will, I make will be real. My thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when my thinking is cleared of wrong motives. That's an amazing thing to have. And the 10-step promises, we cease fighting everyone and everything. 
You know, we have this and we have that. We don't drink anymore, provided we keep in fit spiritual. See, there's always conditions, fit spiritual shape. See, and it says it is easy to let up on the spiritual program of action. We are headed for trouble if we do. And this is where I think a lot of people that have taken the steps or with a lot of time, it's so easy to let up on the spiritual program of action, especially in 10th step. Because we've cleaned the wreckage of our past. And I like to show, I had this bloodied sweater with holes all over it. I did my fifth, sixth, seven, I threw nine. Now I got a brand new sweater. So the whole idea in 10 is I'm sitting around the campfire and the embers are going to come off and they're going to land on my sweater. As long as I go like this, I'm okay. But what do I do? I look at them and go, oh my God, look, it's burning my sweater. Oh my God, I don't like that. It shouldn't have, I shouldn't have been sitting there, you know, and I'm like debating it. There's a, there's a, there's a, uh, one of the stories. A guy's sitting by a lake and he goes, my pants are on fire, my pants are on fire, why are my pants on fire? And everyone says, who the hell cares, just jump in the lake already, you know. And that's what we got to do here. It doesn't matter why I'm an alcoholic, it doesn't matter, you know. And then I have the promise of the 12th step. Having taken the first 11 steps, I now have a spiritual awakening as the result of those steps. And I'm, I'm here trying to carry a message to other alcoholics. I can't. I don't pat my back if someone gets it, and I don't blame myself if they don't. I can only try. That's what it says. And I try to practice these principles in all my affairs to the best of my abilities. And you know what? When I do that, I have a good life. Anyway, uh, thank you all so much for letting me share. God bless each and every one of you. Okay. Uh, Okay, it's time for the seventh tradition. Uh, we will now celebrate the seventh tradition. This has, is an expensive meeting. Please be generous. If we do not meet our expenses on the first path, the best will be passed a second time at the end of the meeting. Please place any court documents or house cards in the basket, and they will be returned to you after the meeting. Would someone like to read uh, the 12 traditions while uh, the, the basket is being passed? Hi, I'm Armin, alcoholic. The 12 traditions, the 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous are to the group what the steps are to the individual. Tradition one, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. Tradition two, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Tradition three, the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. Tradition four, each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Tradition five, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Tradition six, an AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Tradition seven, every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Tradition eight, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Tradition nine, AA as such ought never to be organized, we, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. Tradition 10, Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues. Hence, the AA name ought never to be drawn into public controversy. Tradition 11, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. And Tradition 12, anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles above personalities. Yeah, thanks. Good job. I want to thank Billy also for asking me to speak. I love Billy. He's a great guy. And thanks for your service here at Radford, Billy. We love you, man. Okay. Uh, leader opens up the meeting up. It is now time for sharing our questions and answers. Sharing is strictly limited to three to five minutes. We want everyone to have a chance to participate. A timer will sound after four minutes to let you know that you have one minute remaining. We ask that you share about alcoholism, ego, and self. If you do not stick to the format, we will gently ask you to return to the format. We do not allow foul language as this meeting is recorded and recordings travel everywhere. Who would like to begin? Yes.
Hi, I'm Felix. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Felix. Hi. Um, I don't really have a share, but I was wondering um, if you could speak a little bit more on uh, the, the concept of life versus living, and then also the three facets that you mentioned uh, in your morning prayer, uh, self-pity being one, or helping yourself to divorce yourself from self-pity, and uh, the other two facets, if you don't mind. Okay. Okay. Good question. Well, the, the second question about uh, in, the, in the morning, it's on page 86 uh, of the big book. It's in the 11th step. It's the second suggestion, which is on awaking. What do we do? Now, this is in the 11th step, but it says, you know, we, we, before we do anything, bef- as soon as I get consciousness, I need to go to God at once and ask from the direct my thinking. I need to see this is such an amazing, loving God. It will never mess with my free will. It, it will always give it back to me. And that's one of the hardest problems about step three in prime time. Because step three, we're always taking our... The, the ego has remarkable recuperative powers. Once I start playing God again, once I try to figure it out, I'm in trouble. And it hurts. Doc, it hurts when I do this. Don't do that, you know. But I keep doing it. See, I can't resist that. I, I lack with sufficient force to remember the pain and suffering of even a week or a month ago, even this morning. Why do I keep going to something that hurts? So I start off by asking God to direct my thinking. Um, what was the first question you asked? Oh, life versus living. Yeah, you know, these words, you know, to me, my living, it's just a way of looking at it. So... You know, when I when I really, you know, the original was turn, uh, ter- made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care and direction of God as we understood him. And, you know, and un- as we understood him is underlined or italicized. And in prime time, we like to to make it that he can't be under. Uh, I can't understand an infinite God. I'm finite. So he's understood by me as I'm coming to believe. Now, you know, it's all what you do with the words. Words are just words. You can read them and they mean nothing. And that's what they meant to me when I first got in this program. They were just a bunch of poorly, it was a poorly written book. And let me get to the end and see how this is finished because I don't want to, you know, let me get out of here. Let me get this over with. I'll do anything you say. I'll sign any paper. And that's complying, you see. This is about reading it for my life. So for me, my life is my soul. It's who I am. It's my thought life. My thought life. My living is my three-dimensional world where all my thing that I think is my life. See, I'm not my job. It's just something I do. Uh, uh, a matter of fact, I had to put down my lifelong ambition because it turned out to be a frustrating ambition. And today, my true ambition, it says true ambition is not what we thought it was. True ambition is the deep desire to live usefully and walk hum- humbly under the grace of God. Now, when I first got here, if you said that to me, I would have gone, you know, let me puke. But today, that is why, you know, I never would have thought this would make me so happy in life. Not until I did it. You see, the change of character that happens in seven is I come here now because I want to. My life is good. It doesn't matter what my living is. You know, God's going to provide what I need in the day I'm in. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, I get the bread on the table, I get the roof over the house, I get the stuff in the three-dimensional world. But the fourth-dimensional application, the fourth dimension being, Emmett Fox calls it the three dimensions, time, space, and matter. The fourth dimension is that of spirituality, where thought exists, where prayer exists. It's, it's where the sixth sense operates. See, we base reality on five limited senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Now, just to give you... Uh, uh, sight is our number one reality checker. Oh, well, I got to see it to believe it. But what we see is just an illusion of what we think it is. We can't see most of the stuff. For instance, light, what you're seeing right now, 186,000 miles per second. They don't really know what it is, protons and waves. But there's so many forms, radio waves, microwaves, gamma rays, cosmic rays. We can't see them, but we're all using them. See, they're there, but my eyes can't see them. So this is where you have to open your mind up. This is a spiritual thing, and, and this is a spiritual journey because I have a spiritual malady. And when that is overcome, you see, and you can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't x-ray it. Anyway, I hope that helped a little bit. There's so much here. There's plenty of books, and I'll be glad to talk to you after meeting. Anybody else? Mason.
Hi, uh, Mason alcoholic. Um, happy birthday and congratulations, everyone. Uh, anyways, I was listening to Bob Anderson. He's on our prime the prime time website, primetimeisnow.com. This guy in uh, Armin told me to check it out, so I downloaded like a sh- like all of them. I'm starting to listen to that, and uh, it's just trippy because he's talking about being like with God all times, and which is really hard when your boss is talking to you. And uh, I guess I want to say something funny that I uh, I don't know if I could say this. Uh, so I'm not going to do it, but I'll just say um, Kendrick Lamar is the devil. And uh, don't ra- romance alcohol. And uh, thanks. So I guess my question would be, like, how do you stay with God um, all day long? Like, no matter what. That's where I'm, that's where I want to be. So thanks. It's a practice. What we talk about anything you want to be good at takes practice. Okay. So if you want to be good at you know uh, be in baseball, football, piano, violin, you practice to become good. Spirituality is the same thing. This is not an overnight matter. Uh, you know, it's not a get rich quick scheme. If you want this, it takes a lot of effort. Because I've built up an old habit of thought. Had I been trained this way from the start, it, it, it would have been much easier. But I, I have to overcome all these old attitudes and ideas, these old bad habits, what I, which I think are right. So, you know, pain is the touchstone to spiritual growth. I usually won't go to God. They call it the Bush League pinch hitter. I usually only go to God when I'm in trouble, you see. Oh, God, help me. Get me out of this one. And where was, where was God before I got into trouble? See, the idea is trouble need never come, but it's a hard one. So the Bush League pinch hitter is a good way to start, as long as I'm going to God in any effort I make. Now, there's a principle in step 10. It's a spiritual axiom. Every time I am disturbed, for whatever reason, there's something wrong with me. Well, I'm a pretty disturbed individual. I get upset and disturbed a lot. So I use that. I don't want to feel like that. I cherish my serenity today. I cherish. And that's the only way, according to Emmett Fox and our book, see, we must first quell that disturbance first. So, you know, uh, it's a reminder that when self is coming back, the awareness, see, what we talk about in prime time is the awareness of alcoholism, ego, and self, self-authorizing it all, self, the subject I care most about. I may not be very much, but I'm all I ever think about. It's always about me that makes it a more important thing. You know, somebody's car got hit. Oh, that's a shame. Your car got hit. Oh, now it's a big deal. Of course, it's my car. I got to deal with it. it you know, and uh, it's it's funny. Why is that? Why can't I feel, you know, I, I mean, yesterday I saw someone dead on the ground, a motorcycle accident, and I cried like it was my own family. That was a different change. I couldn't believe what happened. And, and it, I had took all my sponsees and friends and sponsors. I had to, like, really work on it because... I called my sons. I have a 30-year-old. This guy was 30, and I called my sons and told them I love them, and I felt so thankful. And but I was compassionate for this other person. See, that's a different character. That's not who I would have been. It's like, oh, well, that's a shame that happened to somebody else. Good thing it wasn't me, you know. So that's what it usually is. Yeah, you know. So um, it's important to be aware when I'm in self and it's not working for me. Oh yeah, God's there. God, I have to keep trying, but my my head says, oh, it's work. It's the only way to go. God, help me go here. Let me go to talk to the boss. I'm going to the boss now. Intuitively speak through me. Show me what to say and do, you know. I'm going to work today. I'm a little afraid. You know, be, help me to get out of the way, see. And it's all about being a service to others because I'm always so concerned with me. It says our very lives as ex-problem drink, drinkers depend on our constant thought of others and how we may best serve their needs, meet their needs. So it's really important to be aware and then do something. And eventually what happens is I don't go to God because I'm in trouble. I go to God because I want to be nowhere else. See, this is my true ambition today. I love whatever God is for me. I love it. I crave it. I'm an addict. I like feeling good, and it makes me feel good. If it didn't make me feel good, and if AA didn't make me feel good, I wouldn't be here. This thing works, but you got to work it. Anyway, I hope that helped a little bit. Yes. Oh, you had your hand up, didn't you? Uh, then, then you, you, you had your hand up. Uh, hi, my name is Lauren Marie, and I'm an alcoholic and an addict. Uh, today I woke up, and it was pretty cool because uh, it felt like Christmas, you know? Um, it was my 30-day trip today. And it's really exciting, you know? 
I went out on my recovery. Um, I've heard people say I had to go do some more research, and I did. <laughs> and I discovered that uh, I was very depressed and uh, idle, and I couldn't wait to get back to the room. So it only took me three weeks of smoking weed to be like, this is stupid. <laughs> and I came back. And, um, you know, I, I remember getting my 30 days, you know, five months ago, and it wasn't the same as this time. You know, it wasn't Christmas morning. Uh, you know, like, it's as, as so exciting, you know, I, I hear I'm going through that pink cloud again, swear, you know, I'm really excited about that, I hope it stays for a while, you know, when it gets hard, uh, it stays a little hard, and I just thought, I was very confused today, because I was having such a good day, and then all of a sudden, like, a couple hour, hours ago, I'm just like, I'm ready to cry, and I have no understanding why, and, you know, I, I just think that, again, my emotions are are getting ahead, are coming back into play, and and I'm finding them, and I, I, I there's so many I don't know what to do with, um, but I'm really grateful to be here. I'm really glad to collect my 38 chip, and, you know, thank you for being here, because these rooms are possible because of your presence, so I appreciate it. Thanks. Joel, alcoholic. Um, it's always good to hear you speak, Craig. Um, I challenge anyone to word for word know as many sayings as this man right here. It's it's a really it's a mind blowing experience, you know. And every time I, we listen to somebody in this group, it's amazing. Um, you know, we were listening to Perry last night and uh, at the men's stag, and it's like there was a lot of desperate alcoholics there because we had no light, and we uh, still managed to uh, all the power was off, and we still managed to have a meeting. Um, it's a great experience, you know, I'm having a, you know, spiritual experience and, uh, it's a, it's a daily thing. And, uh, my morning meditation has been, become, uh, more and more a part of my life. Uh, I had, you know, I was on page 86 this morning and, uh, you know, before I even start thinking about my day, I'm, I already have to ask God to help remove me from that equation. And it's, it wasn't always like that, you know. Uh, I think a lot of the things that we were talking about last night was, uh, you know, about, about that same subject, about how, um, alcoholics tend to just their, their thoughts take over and, uh, you know, we either live in the, the past or the present because, you know, right now is so un unsatisfactory to us. We're not happy in the present moment. And uh, that's the way, you know, I lived my life for many years. I was always looking for the way out, you know. As soon as I go into the room, I'm looking for the exits, you know. And uh, uh, today I'm looking for the way to live my life uh, without as much pain and without as much suffering. And um, I like to help people that have are uh, as tortured as I have been in my past. And uh, I seem to be running into a lot of people nowadays like that, um, people who have, su have, who have suffered the way I've suffered. And um, I thank God that I'm well equipped to actually help them in a way. And uh, that's that's more important to me now than, uh, than me getting my way because I know that I'm going to be rewarded for it, whether it's... Um, Seeing some, seeing someone's the lights turn on in somebody's eyes, whatever the case may be, I know I'm gonna have. I know God is uh, working in my life, you know, because I, I get out of the way long enough, and then I get to see. I look for God in my life today, you know, and it's amazing. And the the question that I wanted to ask is, is um, it has to do with um, a, the spiritual experience of uh, you know a lot of people say of the now um like a book experience or it's a a spiritual experience of the what variety of educational, the, variety. educational variety like i've had i've had uh you know i think i've had both you know the more i delve into these readings the more i have that educational variety spiritual experience but i wanted to like get your take on it too Thanks for listening. Thanks, Joe. Thanks. Yeah, you know, the big book has an appendix in the back, and it talks about that, because our founder, Bill W., had this white light experience when he took step three, which 
you know, he was so desperate and something happened. He never drunk since. But also, our literature comes because Bill also suffered from depression and he was always chasing that first high, I think, of, of God and, uh, and never satisfied. Um, so the back of the book says there's many kinds in the edge of, you know, and William James wrote this book, uh, re- religious, ex- of, uh, of a, of a variety of his experience. Oh, yeah. Yeah, variety of, of religious experience. But it's one of the books that Dr. Bob has on his mantle. Still, it's still there. That and uh, Emmett Fox's Sermon on the Mount. They were some of the books our founders used by then. I never read that one. But, yeah, you know, for me, the the, the awakening is, is I've been awakened to a whole new way of living. I don't have this. I am not cured of alcoholism. You know, I haven't graduated. If I let up on the spiritual work program of action, I won't have it today. But I get better the more I practice, and I, I like my comfort zone. I like to be comfortable and, and be in serenity because there's no w- way I can find God when I'm in any disturbance. And so it's really important that I this thing works. Why would I fight it? You know, but I do. It's like the ego ego just wants to have say and control over it. So you know, this for me today, it's about peace of mind. My mind is quiet. It's a peace that passes all understanding. It's a knowing that there's something, a force of the universe, that's working. You know, the absolute certainty that the Creator has commenced to accomplish those things for us, which are indeed miraculous. You know, another thing out of the book, page 25, that there is a solution. It says, almost none of us like the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of shortcomings for which the process requires for its successful consummation. See, this is a process in an order form. And for in order to be successful, for it to be consummated successfully, I need to do these things. And uh, But we saw the hopelessness and futility of life as we had been living it. And that can be sober. For me, it was. My bottom was at two-year sobriety. And, and, and so when, therefore, we were approached by those in whom the problem had been solved, we had nothing left to do but to pick up a spiritual kit of tools laid at our feet. And we have found much of heaven and been rocketed to the fourth dimension of existence we had not even dreamed. See, this is a, a place where my mind is quiet. It, it's, it's a knowing, you see. The great fact is just this and nothing less. We have had deep and effective spiritual experiences which have revolutionized our whole idea uh, uh, toward, toward, our, toward life and our fellows and towards God's universe. The fa- central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty, the absolute certainty that God has cr- commenced to create, to do those things for us which we could never do for ourselves. And they are indeed miraculous. Every day I get more exper- empirical evidence of this thing called God working in my life, and I have the absolute certainty. I claim it. There's no doubt in my mind. See, what doubt is a negative prayer. And if you're saying, oh, God's not doing it, I'm not doing it, I'm not seeing it, it ain't working for me, stay out of the results. Don't. There's something called outlining, where I'm looking over my shoulder saying, is it working yet? Is it working yet? See, a watched pot never boils and a watched alcoholic never recovers. Because who's who's the watcher? Alcoholism is watching. Who's judging you? If you're being hard on yourself, who? where are you getting your information from? Me. So... We're all, and that, you don't want to be the judger. I'm the worst judger there is, my own self. Stay out of it. It's none of my business what anyone thinks of me. It's none of my business what any, what I think of me. You know, all that matters is that I, that it's what I, that what God thinks of me, and that I do the best I can. None of us have been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We are not saints. We seek spiritual progress rather than perfection. So, the, the awakening is, the experiences, coupled together, have produced an awakening, and then it's up to me to keep doing it with the application of 10, 11, and 12. And always be mindful that step one and two, they're always there. I'm always an alcoholic. Anyway, I hope that helps a little bit. Um, who? How about a, a woman? Would a woman like to share? Jenica? And the, oh, yeah, then, then you. Go ahead, Jenica, and then, then uh, yeah. I'm Jenica. I'm a grateful alcoholic. My question is, the questions that people come up and ask, are they directly, specifically for the speaker to answer, or can anyone in the room, is that considered crosstalk? Okay. I guess I'm giving the, I'm getting the okay. Uh, I'm Jenica, and I'm an alcoholic. I love you. You're fantastic. I'm so glad to have, have known you for as long as I have. 
Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of talk of um, God and how to be with God, and something that I have learned um, in years of program, uh, not just this program, but other programs, is whatever it is that I'm doing that doesn't feel right, if I'm judging someone, if I'm resenting someone, or something, or some place, or some person, or some whatever it is, that negative emotion, it's a practice for progress for me to immediately go to whatever the exact opposite of that is. So if I'm finding judgment, I go straight for compassion. If I find resentment, I go for forgiveness. Things like that. It's just something that's been asked, and and um, that's 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 what I do. Um, another question that was raised, and I love that you brought this up, was what's the difference between life and living? Living is what I you know have in my life. Like you know, I have my little studio in my apartment, and I get to crochet my little things, and I get to do these things. But it's not who I am because who I am are how I direct my thoughts to be, you know, how I allow God to direct my thoughts to be, and which is always from a place of love. Un, just like uncensored, un, you know, no Jenica, just straight up God love. And then, and, and that's, that's the life for me. That's the life part of it. The living is the, is the day to day stuff. I walk my dog and I go to my meetings and I do my job and, you know, that's, and I, and I'm, Granted that because of the life part of it that I practice for progress to be. That was it. Thank you so much. Cool. Good job. Hi, I'm Angela, grateful recovering alcoholic. Uh, Glad to be at a meeting. Thank you, Craig, so much. That was that was really amazing. Um, don't really know what I'm supposed to say, but I felt the spirit move, so I just got up here. <laughs> and, um, for me, um, I didn't really get step one until I was a lot of years sober. And, um, I had tried it. I was all out of ideas and, um, I went to a lot of meetings and was sponsored and worked the steps and wrote inventories. And, and, um, the one thing I didn't want to do is get quiet. I could not sit still. I could not be quiet with myself. I could not, I could pray. Um, but I just, I couldn't sit still. And I thought, well, maybe that's the one thing that, that I can, that I can try that I haven't tried before. So I started, I started to sit at first just for two minutes, then five minutes, then it got longer. And, um, the amazing thing that happened was I could start to hear my mind. And I, I wasn't coming to prime time. I was just, I was in Chicago and there's no format like this there, but, um, I had all of this information about alcoholism being in my mind. Um, I had the self-knowledge, and I've been thinking a lot about that, um, the difference between self-knowledge, which is going to avail me nothing, right, um, and the awareness that it talks about in this format. Um, and the awareness can only be in the moment that I'm in. Like, you cannot be aware yesterday. You cannot be aware tomorrow. I can't be aware at my house in an hour, I can only be aware right now. And um, I started getting awareness, and I started to see how unmanageable my life was. And so the steps, I, I, they, they're in this line, but it's almost like they go, they've gone in a circle for me, you know, like that's led me to a spiritual awakening, which led me back to the fact that I'm powerless. You know, my obsess, my obsession that I chased was not that I was going to drink normally ever again, because I had admitted that and I didn't think that was ever going to be possible. But the th obsession I chased was that I was going to be able to live life on my own resources, God helping out every now and then when I needed him really bad. Um, and that's just not going to work. And 
I was directed to read um, step three in the big book every day because I went to my sponsor and I said, I just don't get the step three thing. And I was like eight years sober. I was like, I don't know. I don't know why people keep talking about the step three thing. It seems really like, duh, right? And she's like, well, keep reading the, the, the third step uh, in the in the big book. And um, and I did it for, for quite some time. And then she wasn't sponsoring me anymore. And I was still doing it. And... Um, what happened one day is um, all by myself, and it's actually on the primetime format, but I started putting myself, Angela is is the director. She wants to run the show. You know, all of that, and I put it in the first person. And then it gets to the part where it says, and the alcoholic who has lost all. And, and I had this re-realization of my alcoholism and this re a surrender, I suppose, would be a good word for it, um, where I'm never going to be the power for my life. And every time, and I've done inventory, and I wrote this list of de- defects of character, and like every time I go to self for a solution, every time I go to my mind where my alcoholism lives, every time I go to that ego-centered mind and not my God-centered mind, I'm always going to come up short. I'm always... You know, I may get what I want, but then I won't want it anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and I take people down with me. And I'll, I'll say this in, in, in close. It's like it's that steamrolling thing that is alcoholism for me. It's I'm the tornado. Like I don't just affect me with my decisions. I affect everyone in like a 10 mile radius. You know what I mean? That's dramatic and grandiose. But <laughs> you get my point. Um, so thank you. That's all I have. That's awesome. Yes. Do we have time? Well, I was going to go home and read the big book, but I'm Mark. I'm an alcoholic. Thanks for your pitch. Um, you know, they say wisdom comes from experience. And and experience comes from making a lot of bad decisions. And I've done that in my sobriety. You know, we're talking about alcoholism. And for me, it was discovering who and what I really am. I'm a liar. I'm a cheat. I'm a con artist. I'm a manipulator. I'm a deceiver. I'll do any goddamn thing I have to do to get what I want. I'm lazy. I'm greedy. I'm lustful, I'm prideful, Uh, I'm an egomaniac with an inferiority complex, Uh, and and I haven't been an alcoholic yet, who isn't, and if you don't think you can identify with any of that, then maybe you've got a problem with honesty. Uh, These are the things that I discovered about me, and it took time, and it was of the educational variety, it happened slowly, like the appendix says. you know, the the first writing of the 12th step was to have a, a spiritual experience as a result of these steps. And uh, I was fortunate. You know, I chased the, the, I need, I came in a crippled, low life, lower than whale shit, you know, pardon my French. But, you know, the welfare department was in the process of buying my coffin when I got here. And the thing is, is I had nowhere to go but up. And I had to learn a lot of things. Uh, and I learned them from consequences for me. You know, I'm a hard, I'm hard headed. That's just the way it is. And I, once I, I, and I thought I needed, you know, I thought when I first got here, all the guy needed to be okay in this world was a roof over his head, some, some food in his stomach, some jingles in his pocket, and a babe on his arms. And uh, within about 90 days or so, I kind of got that. Now I realize there was a lot more wrong with me than just not drinking. And you're absolutely right, whoever said that. My problems didn't start until I quit drinking. And uh, and I had to learn what emotions were. I heard about that, you know. Uh, I thought I was angry at somebody. And an old time, I would say, you know, when I experience fear, what the hell are you talking about? You know, I, I, it just took time to learn this stuff. 
And, and as I grew and I just, I thought I needed this to be okay. And I'm glad I did all, I got, so, I got sober in small town USA up north, cowboy in Indian country. And I thank God I did because it allowed me living in a fishbowl like that to go through everything and, and a lot of shit in my first year. And I thought, okay, I get my place. That's what I need to be okay. I need stuff for that place. I'll be okay. Uh, uh, I need I need a car. That's what I'll be okay then. I, I need a woman. I'll be okay then. Uh, no, I need more women. Yeah, okay, I need that. I need school. Yeah, I need that. I got to go back to school. No, no, I, I, I need my son back. Yeah, so I get my son back. Uh, and I need to be president of AA, and I got that, you know. And, then it was about that time that I realized that I was up against the wall. And I did this fourth step. It took about a year to get to that process. And I, fortunately for me, I had what they call a, a not a burning bush. I think it was way beyond that. I, I put it on the same plane as, as a nirvana. And, and it lasted for a few months. Uh, my fifth through my ninth, of course. Uh, uh, and the thing is, is that I did things on purpose to come down because my spiritual elevation was so far removed from, quote, the human race that I did stuff on purpose to, to come on down. And as time has, has come, has transpired, I have learned through just living and through experience. You know, I think every alcoholic in this room is an expert at one thing. What not to do, you know. So uh, before I end with this, you know, I heard something else I heard earlier. I take my will back. Well, I don't know about you. I'm from cowboy and Indian country. And, and, you know, when I truly surrendered my will and my life over the care of a higher power, which I choose to call God, I firmly believe that God isn't an Indian giver. Because in the big book, it also states that everything, nothing, absolutely nothing happens in this world by mistake. So everything I go through, I'm supposed to go through. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.